your alternative talk radio contact, the planet, KGRARadio.com. Infinite complacency. People went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Hello, everybody. To get everyone a little amped up for this upcoming episode, uh, first of many, hopefully, with Bill Sheehan, Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, I thought I would play a recording that was sent to me. I've been waiting for a little while for the appropriate show to play this. But this is courtesy of a source in the Olympic Project. A huge thanks to him. And he says, this has been enhanced to bring forward the vocal of interest and diminish the white noise background. He says, the witness from a state which I will not name, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to, that recorded the audio was introduced to me about three years ago. The following recording is one of many clips that have been cultivated from this witness. He goes on to say, the witness did not even know that this vocalization was recorded. I almost missed it myself and probably would have if I didn't see the telltale voice print of something of interest. And he is, of course, talking about uh, spectrograph analysis. And before I hit play on that and then we get to Bill, remember the hotline is still open. 877-317-9111. You can call that anytime. You've got about five minutes exactly. If you need to call back, just pick right up where you left off, and I will take care of the rest. I just put up a new Insider episode featuring uh, several of the calls that I've received, but to access that and all other Insider audio and video content, just go to the website, intothefrayradio.com, and click Become an Insider. There are two different options, only $4.99 a month or $54 for the entire year. So if you enjoy Into the Fray, consider supporting it. Like always, please go to your listening platform of choice and rate and review. Helps others find the show. And it's working because I get a couple emails or messages a week saying uh, they found the show. They're new to the show. They're going through the back episodes and trying to catch up. That's an awesome feeling. So thank you guys so much. Keep that up. And now for the vocalization. Keep in mind, this is five times looped. Hello, Bill. <laughs> How are you? How you? Good. How you doing, Chad? I'm doing awesome. It's good to finally talk to you. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. I love uh, I, I love doing these shows and uh, talking all things Bigfoot. And I'm meeting a lot of nice people along the way, too, so it's really cool. Good. Yeah, there's a few good beans in this whole thing, right? <laughs> yeah, a few. I have run into a couple of clunkers, <laughs> but... Uh, for the most, yeah. for the most part, uh, a good spirited group of uh, people, you know. Good spirited, I like that. See, that's a that's a good moniker for us to hold. I like it. <laughs> so, how you doing? I'm doing excellent. Um, 
I mean, it's it's sunny and boring here, you know, 65, so nothing too exciting. <laughs> but you're suffering greatly. I, I am. I Everyone really should feel sorry for me because it's just supremely boring. No excitement <laughs> whatsoever. Every damn day, sunny in, in the 60s, so. Wow, wow. What, well, I don't know how you can uh, go on for much longer. I know. But try to hang in there. <laughs> I know. That's why. That's really the whole reason I even started the podcast. I don't even give a crap about Bigfoot or ghosts or UFOs. It's just so that I can get somewhere that's dark and quiet, like a nice quiet closet, and act like maybe it's a little creepy and scary and the weather might play along outside. No, still sunny. <laughs> well, I Bummer. I don't have that same experience <laughs> where I live. Uh, we yeah. went from uh, 15 degrees below zero a yeah. week ago uh, to the 30s today. Uh, I'd say half of the days it's been blowing a gale over here with tree branches uh, uh, falling out in the yard and uh, flags whipping around in the wind. And it's just been, uh, but for the most part, the winter has been superb as far as lack of snowfall. Yeah, slightly mild then. Yeah, it's just that the, the days when we have all the precipitation, it's warmer. So yeah. we've been looking, we lucked out supremely this year in that uh, my snowblower is sitting in the shed uh, having not been started. It, it, well, <laughs> see, then and, and that thing's really bummed out because it's like my whole reason for being and Bill doesn't need me. <laughs> well, I will send you some of my uh, crap weather if you want to uh, have yeah. some. Um, I will try my best. <laughs> <laughs> oh no i'm longing for 65 degrees boy and, uh, well i'm a i'm a fisherman uh and uh you know the target species that i go for leaves this area for the winter uh they go up the hudson river and uh the chesapeake bay area to uh winter rover and spawn and what gets them moving is about 50 degrees water temperature again that starts them on their move you right. know so it's it's always a while uh before that occurs you know and it's typically eh, latter part of april uh, into may and june you know where things really get running you know uh but i, I mean i really look forward to that that's my uh my peace and my solace is just heading down by the shore and, uh, you know, doing a little fishing. You know, that's that's what I do to unwind. Yeah, I read that in the first part of your book, and I thought I can relate to that because I also love to go fishing. I don't do it enough. Of course, it's a little tougher with me being here in Vegas, but uh, mm -hmm. grew up going fishing in Utah and then got to do a little tiny bit of it in Ohio, but that was far less than it was in Utah when I was growing up, so I missed that. Yeah, Utah, you have tons of beautiful uh, trout streams and yes. rivers, no? Uh, yeah, an amazing amount. And like you said, even even just the rivers and streams, you can go and, and toss a line in and, and have a good shot at coming out with something. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about it. You have some pristine conditions up there, uh, Montana, Utah... Uh, Wyoming. There. In fact, I have an uh, uh, an account. Uh, what, what did I name that account? You know, I come up with these names as I'm making the account for what I'm going to call the account. But the account generally doesn't mean anything to me <laughs> until until I uh, look at the the the, uh, the people and the first few lines, and I'm like, oh yeah. yeah it's the best uh, way to do things. I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, it's just. It's, I'm not trying to uh, over embellish anything. It's, right. it's a pretty simple process, you know. And uh, uh, like a few of the ones you picked out today were named basically by the uh, uh, the area that they happened in. You know, I just said, well, you know, if this was the Las Vegas encounter, that it's the Las Vegas encounter. Wait, then you didn't want to name the one that we're going to eventually talk about and call it a huge pile of. You know, like, yeah. didn't that cross yeah. your mind? Oh, the, I mean, <laughs> the logger's tale, that was freaking incredible. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, uh, uh, that guy or those guys are not alone. I have at least, I know of one other that just comes to my mind. I think I have three different encounters uh, where uh, people came across uh, large scat piles that were evidently not 
from anything known uh, to walk in the forest. So, you know, that in and of itself, there's so much repetition uh, with what comes across the uh, table, so to speak, Yes, that it's hard to deny, uh, you know, the existence of these creatures and the inability of those finding and coming across things uh, not knowing what they're seeing. I mean, most of these people, like this logger, he freaking spends his life in the woods. You know, he doesn't know what a, 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 a pile of deer turd looks like in reference to a bear. Right. You know, it's just ludicrous. It's, it's ludicrous to think none of these people have any idea what they're seeing and uh, can't possibly make, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a wise judgment call in reference to it. You know, it's just insane to me. Yeah, everybody likes to throw out the misidentification, and in quite a few cases, that is the case. But in many, there's there's no way. Like you said, these people, some of them spend their entire lives out in the bush, and when they they see something, and it might start with a pile of scat, or maybe a footprint, or a clump of hair, and it is anomalous, and then lo and behold, they actually see the creature it belongs to, it, that's a lot of evidence piled up towards it being yeah. exactly what we're writing about and, and what we're going to talk about today. And in fact, Bill, before I do a proper intro for you, have you caught online, I think it just broke today or maybe even yesterday and I just saw it today, but the three-year-old who was gone for three days and said that he was cared for by a bear. Did you see that? Where, what place did this occur in? What uh, state? Yeah, I'm going to have to send it to you once. You, Please do. I, yeah, I've heard you, nothing about it. You would, I want to see what you think about this because um, I don't know all the exact details. And the few articles that I've read were very vague, but maybe that's all the details that they had. But, and this kind of is a strange portion of it, but besides the whole, I was taken care of by a bear, which they should be hibernating. But beyond that, he was found... 40 yards away from the original location where he he went missing. So that immediately jumps in my mind, like the whole missing 411 thing. Like, was he brought back to this location so that he would be found? And he was found um, in a briar patch uh, in a bush. It's just so strange. And he said that a bear took care of him for three days. And, and this was uh, on uh, a news broadcast of some kind? Yeah, it's breaking news all over just regular media. Um, and in fact, this was in a very cold location. I think it was below freezing temps. I'll send you the, the article. Um, that way you can look over it once uh, we're, we're done talking because I'd like to get your opinion on this. But Wow. No, yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to. See, I'm not much of a news junkie. And the news that we do have on our set here... Uh, is local news. It's actually a network called uh, News 12 Long Island. Uh -huh. And they, they are put on by our cable provider. And it legitimately is predominantly news about Long Island. Uh, there's a couple of little blurbs in there here and there about, uh, you know, what's going on in Washington or, you know, the latest scandalous uh, movie star yes. blurb. But uh, I, I kind of, I, I don't know, in any regard, I haven't seen anything about this little guy, and I'd love to see it because, I mean, that just reeks of Bigfoot. Isn't that strange, being that small, yeah. all alone, for three days, in freezing temperatures, how in the world did he survive? And he's the one saying, oh, no, a bear took care of me. Well, maybe he just doesn't know what to call it, right? So he says a bear. Yeah, um, well, what else would you call it? Kid, kid knows yeah. nothing about Bigfoot. Right. So Big, I big, hairy, furry vicious looking but if it was gentle in that circumstance you know it, what does he know he's just telling you what he knows from this you know juvenile brain that he has exactly it's it's the only wow. word he could find out of all the, the kitty books that his parents have probably been reading him over his uh short time on the planet but yeah i will link that and also for everybody listening i will put that in the show notes so let me do a proper intro here for you bill because we've been planning this for a while and i told you that if you were up for it, which you said you are, we are going to do subsequent entire episodes per volume, uh, as long as you can stand to do them. So this one is volume one, and the title of the book is Bigfoot, Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters. And again, this episode is all about volume one. I have, as Bill mentioned, chosen a few of these said stories and uh, accounts that he has taken from these folks. 
And Bill, how many volumes do you have now? Well, there's uh, six volumes out. Uh, I'm, I'm encouraging people to go through uh, www.buybigfootbooks.com. It's actually a, a page I set up. And the reason I did that was uh, I'm doing some uh, audio readings on YouTube. Oh, nice. Oh, a lot of, yeah, a lot of people said, oh, the, I'd love to hear this stuff read or an audio book. And to be honest with you, at my age and with my computer uh, knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not quite up to that task yet. But uh, between my daughter and myself, we were able to get some recordings up on YouTube. And I put a little link there, or she put a little link there, to take them to that page. But they're actually on uh, Amazon and uh, ebook as well. And there's six books. I'm in the middle of uh, volume seven. I was actually uh, finishing uh, my latest account. Well, it's not my latest account, but the latest account in book seven, uh, 15 minutes before we began this phone call. Well, I'm excited to hear that you're still working on these. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, well, I've got a lot of information. I've been at this long and hard. And uh, although uh, sometimes I read the criticisms, uh, both good and bad, about the book from different people and even podcasts. And uh, one lady said, uh, I'm not buying it. <laughs> like literally or figuratively, right? You're like, well, which one do you mean, though? Yeah, well, she must have bought it because she was <laughs> commenting on the book. Yeah. But she was commenting on the uh, amount of stories claiming that it's an impossibility uh, mm. to come up with so many people. But the reality is there are so many people out there. And I was encouraged when I first started tuning in uh, Finding Bigfoot. And they were doing these... Uh, town hall meetings, mm -hmm. the amount of hands that were going up in these kind of impromptu meetings to me was incredible. I mean, you know, they'd have 250 people uh, gathered in uh, a glorified barn somewhere in the middle of a town in Oregon, and, you know, 90% of the people raised their hand when they were asked uh, if they thought they had encountered uh, a Bigfoot. And might I interject really quickly that, and I know that people have their opinions on finding Bigfoot, and that's fine, but I was lucky enough while I was in Ohio to attend a taping for the, one of the town halls. And I will tell you, in fact, and I know this for certain because a couple of these people I knew personally and knew that they had had encounters. And so it's not like they're finding people and saying, okay, so here's your angle and here's your story you know, make sure you hit these points and raise your hand at the right time. And, you know, you need to act like you're you're really stressed out about it. Those are real people uh, mm -hmm. that, that are intermingled amongst kind of those of us, quote unquote, normal folk like myself who are just interested in the subject. So mm -hmm. I will tell everybody right now, those town hall meetings are legit. And then once the actual filming wrapped... Uh, while they were getting the bits and pieces of the stories, they were actually busting out maps and going, okay, well, you know, now we're, we're going to go to this location for this sighting and this location for this one and making a plan to continue, of course, filming over the next few days uh, the way that they would do. But yeah, I don't really find it that hard to believe that you have been able to find this many people. But I mean, are you able to kind of share how you were able to find these folks or, you know, is it all through email or how did it work? Well, for you? no, uh, you know, I've said this a couple of times and really I have to stop saying that otherwise I'm going to have a hundred people, uh, knocking on the same door as I am. Uh, but I use old school methodology or should I say old school methodology is an excellent way of gathering information. And I'll just give you a hint and say pre-internet. <laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> nope, I like it. Let's not expound upon that further, shall we? <laughs> you know, and then the other thing is, you know, uh, and now with my books going uh, uh, for sale, on the inside of the cover of the first or second page, I breach the question or, or I make the statement, if you've seen something, say something. And I leave my email there. Uh, and I'm reaching out to people who are reading the book to contact me uh, 
in regards to what they have seen or, or evidence they think they have found and whatnot. And that's actually working out uh, as well. Uh, I just got off the phone with a guy in South Texas, uh, I think it was last week, had an incredible evidentiary finding uh, while hunting hogs. And, um, I mean, we could go in a hundred directions with the conversation, and that's kind of the way it goes with Bigfoot, but this hog population, or these feral boars or pigs uh, that are infesting areas of the country right now, seem to be be becoming a uh, a huge food source for the Bigfoot. Uh, I've got a number of accounts involving uh, hog hunters and hog hunting uh, in regards to evidence and or seeing Bigfoot uh, going after hogs or attacking hogs. So they're definitely opportunistic, you know, and uh, a big fat pig literally uh, seems to be all right with them. So what you're saying is you and I need to take up hog hunting to increase our chances of seeing a Bigfoot. I like it. <laughs> I, I read that you, you dabble in archery quite heavily, so I could practice and then out hunting we go. <laughs> it's worth a shot. You know, right? what, one guy uh, asked me, um, I think he said, where do I hunt deer or what kind of bow do I use to hunt? Mm -hmm. He didn't realize... Uh, I shoot uh, both bow and arrow and uh, guns uh, purely for uh, target practice, marksmanship. Yeah. So I really don't hunt anything. <laughs> so, but I have a good knowledge of uh, uh, some firearms and uh, archery and uh, and the like, you know. But. Uh, Okay, well, what, what if I go to Bass Pro Shops? We'll get one of the, um, the the plastic hogs, and then we can just go on YouTube and do the whole replay of the hog, maybe <laughs> a pig distress or whatever it might be, right? <laughs> People do that with the baby uh, cries. Sometimes that works. So uh, pig, pig distress call, that's what we need. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> all right, well, you know, if you're up to it, maybe we can give it a try <laughs> something. And then you know what? If it doesn't work after a couple hours and the pig squealing just drives us nuts, we'll just go fishing. It's no big deal. <laughs> now we're talking. That's yeah. more my speed. So, okay, so uh, before we get into more of this, this stuff, after all, collecting all of these encounters, and some of them are hair-raising and terrifying to say the least do you want to see one do you would you want to have any of the experiences that you've written in your books uh, because some of these are uh, horrible you know not not in the least yeah uh you know really uh nothing these creatures speak nothing but danger to me and i know there's going to be a whole bunch of people out there that are going to hate me immediately after saying that oh wait don't you don't but, want to go braid their hair bill yeah, no, uh, Bill's not good at hair braiding. <laughs> Maybe pulling hair out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not, <laughs> but not braiding hair. No. Yeah. Uh, but if I was to see a Bigfoot, I would prefer that it would be at a distance. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, contrary to what others say, uh, I would have no problem I identifying a Bigfoot mm -hmm. over a walking human yeah. or uh, a dancing bear. Uh, and I would leave it at that. I, I wouldn't go pursuing this thing. Uh, first of all, they can, uh, them running after you would be like you trying to escape from a car going down the street in front of your house. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, and the chances of you being on the receiving end of, uh, uh, death, uh, I think are pretty good. Uh, if one of these things starts to bear down on you or thinks, uh, that you shouldn't be where they are. Uh, the whole thing just reeks of, of trouble uh, to me. And, and no, uh, if I was even thinking of going in an area... Now, when I say this, when I say going into an area where they're prone to be, uh, I have encounters coast to coast, north and south, east and west. 
but there are definitely areas where there seem to be a preponderance of sightings occurring. Uh, that's not to say in my own neighboring states of New Jersey, Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, uh, just going around me and just reaching out like fingers into the United States, uh, people are encountering these creatures. And uh, if I was to go hiking or moving around in any of, any of these areas, uh, I would definitely have some uh, serious hardware on me, Yeah. Uh, you know, in the form of uh, weaponry. Uh, just in case. Or a tank. You could always take a tank fishing. Now, what about <laughs> what about your areas, though, Bill, that you go fishing? Have you done any research or heard of any sightings in places that you were going to go fishing? You're like, you know what? I'm going to try a new spot today. No, there's, there's absolutely nothing around me. I live on Long Island. Oh, you're and, on Long Island. Gotcha. Yeah. They do the, swim, though. I mean, not to rain on your parade, <clears throat> but I've heard accounts of them being quite good swimmers. They they like the, doing the breaststroke and the whole thing, and they're they're adept at everything, and it's quite terrifying. Yeah, I uh, I have a couple of accounts of uh, sighting swimming in lakes, uh, both of them occurring in Canada. Mm. Uh, but here on Long Island, the western end of the island is connected to... Uh, uh, Manhattan mm -hmm. uh, and the boroughs, you know, the Bronx and right. Brooklyn, Queens. Uh, the other end is Montauk Point, and on one side of me I have the Long Island Sound, which is probably about 20 miles wide at its at its widest point, and then on the uh, south shore, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, it is, uh, we have a lot of deer around here. There's a lot of little critters. It's not all city. Uh, there's a fair amount of farmland. Uh, uh, I live, uh, right on the edge of what's known as the Pine Barrens. Uh, tremendous amount of acreage of just, uh, protected, uh, pine forest. Uh, but n nothing like that would be around here. There are supposed rumors, though, now of, uh, uh, coyote sightings and how the heck they could get here is beyond me. I mean, I can't picture one of these things thumbing a ride over the uh, Throgs Neck Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> they really have uh, grown yeah. leaps and bounds in their gray matter. Yeah, and now they can thumb a ride. I mean, people, I pick them up. Why not? Give them a shot. Yeah. So, but uh, no, we're not gonna we're not gonna have any Bigfoot around here. Uh, but. You know, uh, you know, there's something so disturbing to me. There's a couple things. It, like you said earlier, it it depends on the situation. It had to be the perfect situation to see a Bigfoot and not need a diaper or to it ruins your life and you never go in the woods again. But number one, them being sighted up in trees. I feel like if I looked up and saw a Bigfoot in the trees, it, it would that would screw me up. And then number two, the whole swimming in the water thing. No, yeah. I don't ever want to see that. I remember Will Jevening bringing up an account where a man was in a canoe fishing <laughs> bill uh -huh. um and um and he saw it actually it was a, an auburn colored a red colored bigfoot it swam directly under his canoe and then surfaced uh at, at some distance away but i'm like nope mm -mm, no thanks don't wow. want to see that yeah that'd be akin to seeing a great white uh swimming under your absolutely. boat absolutely you're like well i don't have an option here to do anything i'm kind of screwed aren't i yeah, if he yeah, wants you're, to come you're, up. you're, you're, you're uh, you, uh, to me, you get in close quarters with these creatures, and you're lucky if you've gotten away. Uh, I had a, a a group of men fishing in uh, Canada. Uh, the guide stopped the boat and pointed to them what they thought was a moose mm -hmm. swimming across this lake. And uh, they're watching and watching and watching, and they get. This creature gets to a shallow, a shallower area in the lake where it now stands on two feet and starts walking. Mm. So now they're seeing half of the Bigfoot sticking out of the water and walking with his arms swinging and pushing the water. And everybody knew this was not a moose we had been watching. And then as it kept walking, it got into a deeper section again and went back in the water, back into this what appeared to be like, you know, what we would call a doggy paddle. 
uh, no visible arms over the top, no legs kicking in the water. Every, all the momentum was being created below the surface, whatever its uh, swimming uh, style was. And then when it got uh, close to the shore, it gradually shallowed out, came completely out of the water, and walked into the trees. Wow. That is a hell of a sighting right there. Yeah. I mean, but this is the way things happen. You know, when I've said this uh, a hundred times, that a lot of the people who are seeing this creature are out there doing things that the average person is not doing and in places where, where even adventurous people are not going. So it really seems that a bunch of these sightings are happening uh, in and around places where your average Joe or Jane uh, is not going on their day off or after work. Right. Yeah. And just let everybody know that he does not give out precise locations within the book, which is completely understandable. And of course, you do not share the real names, which is, again, extremely understandable. So there was the, yep. uh, the PSA for everybody before we dig in here. Yeah, and that's the thing, too. Uh, uh, I'm, and not that it even matters, because the story to me is what it's all about. But I'm not bringing you into anybody's neighborhood and saying, you know, go to 25 Smith Street and talk to Shannon. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. No, I mean it's 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 really all about the testimony uh and what happened. Uh I'm getting you, I'm getting you in the neighborhood, but uh you know, uh nowhere close <laughs> if you catch my drift. Yeah, close but no cigar everybody. That's so it. and That's and it. no need to email me or Bill cuz we will not be divulging any of that information anyway. Yeah. Okay. That's for sure. So let's jump in here, Bill, if you don't mind. Uh, we're going to start on the Allegheny Trail, and this is the Shenandoah Park sighting. Yeah, very interesting uh, story. And by the way, uh, I was I was uh, very much intrigued by your selection of stories. Uh, and it's different with everybody. Uh, when I finished writing book six, my daughter said to me, wow, uh, she does my editing for me. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, wow, this was the best of the bunch. And when I was putting book six together, <laughs> I don't want to shoot it down, <laughs> but in my heart, it was the least of the bunch. Really? So, and now that I go back and look at it and, and whatnot, I was like, no, maybe she, maybe she was right. <laughs> you know, but you get caught up in the work. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you're overlooking uh, the details or the encounters. And really, like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, the Bigfoot story is in the eye of the listener or the reader, you oh, know? Yes. If, uh, but let, yeah, let's uh, get into this. This uh, story uh, is called the Shenandoah Park Sighting, and uh, without any further ado, let me introduce you to Robert Woods as he begins to tell us of his encounter. Uh, Robert began in this way, I guess as I begin, I should tell you how I came to be where I was when I saw the beast in Shenandoah Park. My wife had divorced me sometime before, and rather than sitting around and moping about the whole grisly affair, I took up exercising, weightlifting, and bike riding, uh, to be more precise, as well as a lot of walking. After about a year or so, I was clocking about five or six miles a day in walking distance alone, and I was quite fast. The speed developed out of necessity since I had a limited time to take my walks due to my work schedule and everything else that was going on in my life at that time. I increased my speed to ensure that the same amount of miles would be attained every time out, and over a period of about three years, I became fitter than I have ever been in my entire life. So at least something good had come out of a hideous divorce. Now, I hope you don't mind me reading that, but I always encourage people to uh, lay out for me whatever they feel in their heart as it relates to the how and why of yes. 
how their encounter developed. And, and, and many times there's nothing. But in this case, uh, uh, he shared in this way. So his next phase was to begin pushing the limits of what he could do. And he said, I decided that when I could get time off, I would take little four or five day vacations going to areas where I could actually hike and see something. Up to this point in time, the only thing I was seeing was the surrounding homes in my community. My trip to Shenandoah was actually one of many hiking destinations I had traveled to. It began, as most did, by contacting the park and sending for a brochure. After that, I scoped out the available accommodations, preferring to camp in or near the location of the hike, and then I would plan my trip accordingly. Having gone through my punch list, my plan for Shenandoah was to set up a camp at a place called Big Meadows, and from there I would walk the area between Big Meadows and Thornton Gap. I would be walking on a section of the Allegheny Trail where there was fairly good elevation up to about 4,000 feet, according to the map. The route that I had chosen had many overlooks as well as some interesting things to see along the hike, and to me, it looked perfect. It was just enough of a challenge for where I was physically at the time. It was late summer, and my hope was that there wouldn't be too many people up there while I was there. In my heart, I had always envisioned myself living the life of the guy in High Plains Rifter, confident, alone, and able to handle whatever came my way. Well, this was as close to that as I, was, I would get, uh, or as I would get, I was the high trails drifter one day at a time. For the day's hike in Shenandoah, my goal was to make it to a place called Corbin Cabin, after which I would trek back to camp. The scenery on the way to the cabin was breathtaking. To get there, you had to cross a street, a small creek breaking off from the Allegheny Trail, and the cabin itself was located near the base of Pinnacle Peak in a place called Nicholson's Hollow. When I had finally arrived at the cabin, I was amazed at how much guts it must have taken for someone not only to come here, but to build this miniature homestead by hand so many years ago. It was a small cabin built on a stone foundation, having one main room with a small side addition. There was a fireplace and porch, and each one of the cabin's timbers was hand-hewn. I could only imagine the amount of labor involved in constructing it. The brochure had said it had been inhabited by an old mountaineer who must have been even more like the High Plains Drifter. So this guy had a little hang-up on uh, Clint Eastwood. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> having, <laughs> having met the halfway point to my goal, I turned around and started to head back. It had been a great day, and by the time I made it back to the campsite, I was bushed. The next day, I packed up and drove north a short distance to the Thornton Gap entrance station. This time, I was going to hike from the other direction, heading from north down towards Corbin Cabin and back. In this way, I would be able to cover a fairly nice section of the trail by way of two day hikes. So once again, I took off for the day's journey. There was a considerable amount of wildlife visible along the route, and I had brought my Nikon 20 by 50 binoculars with me. They were a bit bulky, but well worth the extra effort and weight. I was encountering many deer off the side of the trail here and there, and for the most part, the birds were very different from those where I live, which can be expected when one travels to different regions of the states. I was so glad that I came here, and I had just passed the area where I had cut off a uh, Corbin cabin yesterday, pushing on a little further until I reached a spot called Stony Man, and I sat down for a rest. The vistas from here were incredible, full of rolling hills and woods as far as the eyes could see. The sun was bright, and I felt more alive than I had ever been. I was eating some granola bars and drinking water when I decided to break out the Nikons and have a look around. At one point, I had put them down and was just looking with my eyes when I noticed two black objects in a clearing way off in the distance below. It took me a minute to realize they were both moving. 
I picked up the binoculars and focused in on the objects in question. I would have to say they were about a thousand yards away from me and I watched them for quite a while. With the binoculars, I was able to tell that these objects were actually a large black bear and a cub, and they were feasting on what appeared to be a deer carcass. I hadn't seen the bear take the deer down, and I was wondering if the deer had died recently and they sniffed it out for a meal. I must have been watching them for 15 or 20 minutes before it happened. Now, I must warn you that the next series of events went down so quickly that it was actually quite difficult to figure out just what happened. With the binoculars field of view, within the binoculars field of view, a large and darkly colored figure came running into the frame. I don't know how much ground it actually covered, but it looked like perhaps 75 yards in two or three seconds. Not only was this thing booking, but it was running upright on two legs. At the same time that I caught sight of the figure, I saw the larger bear lurch and jump to the side of the carcass, and the little one bolted away. This all happened in a matter of seconds. The creature closed the gap between itself and the bear quickly and ended the sprint, making head-on contact with the bear, knocking it to the ground. I could see its arms flailing as it remained atop the bear, and it was a short-lived fight. Everything stopped. There may have been sound, but from my distance, I couldn't hear anything at all, as this thing was now sitting still on top of the bear, straddling its body. A minute later, the cub reappeared at a distance. I saw the creature wave its arms, and moments later, the cub scurried into the brush and was out of sight for good. I continued to watch the scene for about 30 minutes. The strange creature tossed the bear's head back and forth in its two hands. Now, I don't know how tall a bear is from the ground to the top of its back, but I would have to say that by the brief period when I had seen it running, the creature was at least three times as tall as the bear was high. So if the bear was three feet tall, this creature was nine or ten feet tall. It was immense. Its arms almost looked to be as long as the bear's total body length. I had to be looking at a Bigfoot, and this Bigfoot had just charged and killed a black bear. I watched the creature for about another 15 minutes, but time was not on my side. As awesome as this was, I had to complete my hike back before it got dark, and I was already wondering if I could make it back in time. What do you think of that? Well, I think that one of the first things that jumped out to me, I mean, besides the actual act of it killing the bear, was the fact that it spared the cub. I was like, well, that was that was interesting. It just kind of said, nope, go away, not dealing with you. Yeah, I mean, waving it off. And yeah. and like he said, at that distance, you couldn't hear, hear anything. Maybe it went, you know, Rawr! Yeah, right. And, and then right. it scared it or frightened it with the arm wave, like, get out of here, kid. Yeah, uh, I, but, yeah, that that would be definitely one of the things that you were mentioning earlier as far as, you know, there's a, a list of sightings that would be okay to have, uh, a short list, and then there's a, a very long list, and this is included in them to where it would be a very terrifying sighting. Yeah, I Even mean... Even though he uh, was very far away. I mean, just to know that that's out there, he's already hiked as far as he has back in the bush, and now you're going, great, and it's going to be getting dark soon. Well, the thing is, too... Uh, you know, in many of these sightings, people have commented at the speed and agility of these creatures in close quarters. And, you know, really, if you were to be walking down a trail, uh, meandering through through the woods, it wouldn't take this thing but a split second uh, to grab you by the head and dispatch with you. Right. You wouldn't know what hit you. Uh, you know, so the idea of you being able to get away from it or you being able to get away from a mountain lion or a charging grizzly bear, 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not placing any wages on you escaping. No, and not only not escaping, but the fact that it could probably grab you, and you wouldn't even be able to maybe even make a sound. So you could have you could have your your friend up ahead of you, t- you know, hiking fifteen. 20 feet in front of you and zip, you're just gone. So it kind of makes you wonder about some of the other cases that we've heard where people go missing and somebody was right there. Think about if the hand, uh, I have, I wear extra, extra large gloves and I look at my hand and my hand is nothing next to one of these uh, creatures from the descriptions I've heard. One guy described uh, in the account of the prospector's letter, this old timer described the fingers of the creature it had shot as being the size of a large cigar. Yeah. Uh, and these are when they rolled cigars big and nasty, the old stogies, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I thought to that and I said, holy smokes, you know, we're talking about, and those are just the fingers. You know, that if that thing just extended out and got the jump on you around your throat, with some type of like superhuman grasp and just snatched you, you're done. You know, I mean, you'd, you'd be done so quick. And if it grabbed you with two hands and just snapped your head or something, uh, I, I don't think you'd really uh, have time to make a chirp. I think that'd be the good way to go. I mean, if you, if you had to get drug off into the woods by a Bigfoot, I'd rather be dead by the time his second foot hit the other side of the trail, you know? <laughs> I'd just take me now. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I guess we wouldn't have much choice in how the end came. <laughs> no. <laughs> but if yeah, if you could uh, choose an end, yeah. uh, I would say that would be better than whatever the uh, latter would be. Yeah. I'd be like, Mr. Bigfoot, uh, and just we'll- give me the old squeeze. Let's go. Just close down on the esophagus. I'll be okay. <laughs> you know, and it's funny you mention that because I wasn't even thinking about the uh, it chasing the little uh, the cub away. Uh, That really lines up with uh, what we were talking about earlier with the little kid missing and coming back Mm -hmm. uh, saying the bear was taking care of him. Yeah, there's some real, uh, it makes you wonder if, you know, if the kid got taken care of by a a female squatch that she just had a soft spot for him, you know, and and maybe maybe the Bigfoot saw the, the cub is just, well, you're not worth my time. That very well could have been it, and he already killed the larger bear, and who knows what he did with it afterward. But I don't know. Is that are we putting human traits on a, a Bigfoot that he just cared enough to let it go and live its life and cross him at a different time? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. And I'm uncertain as to whether or not the creature's intent was to kill the bear. Uh, or whether he thought it would run seeing him and he just grabbed this uh, uh, deer. Uh, but apparently it had made a mitted charge, and when the bear mm-hmm. stood its ground, he just took it down. I mean, it, it's incredible. I mean, to see one animal attack another in such a fashion uh, and dispatch it so quickly. But uh, this is what this fellow says he saw. Yeah, and that's true. I mean, the Bigfoot might have just wanted exactly what the bears did, just a leftover meal. And when the bear stood its ground, yeah, you're probably right. He's like, well, shoot, I kind of committed to this one now, so I guess I'm going to have to take you out. Yeah, you know, and who knows? He's looking at a distance. He says a 1,000 feet. Who, who knows what he was actually looking at? Right. But and you don't know if there was ensuing biting uh, you know, that really aggravated it or whatever. He said he saw the arms flailing, uh, whether that was uh, punching or slapping or, or grappling and retreating when the bear was snapping at him. You don't know at that point, you know, but push came to shove and the uh, the Bigfoot was victorious. Now, I didn't get into the latter part of that because he was just elaborating on what we already spoke about. Right, yeah. Uh, he took a picture kind of knowing in his heart it wouldn't come out and it didn't come out in the picture it when it was developed all that came out was this little bot uh that he knew uh was a bigfoot you know but as far as anybody else seeing on on his wall uh, nobody would even know what the picture was right. or, or the significance of the uh the dark spot on it you know but he had he had kept it as like a memento 
of uh, what he had seen. And I thought that was pretty uh, cool, too, you know? Well, and that's what's quite frustrating about when people go, well, you had a camera, why didn't you take a picture? I mean, un- unless it's very, very close and it's perfectly still, the picture is not going to really even show up and do justice to what it actually is. Most people don't go traipsing around on hikes with uh, $10,000 telephoto lenses. So... Uh, you know, without that, then no, you, you're you not going to get a picture. Well, at this point in time, with, uh, with, uh, within the context of talking about Bigfoot, I've said this before and I'll say it to you tonight, it really doesn't matter what the pictures anymore mm-hmm. because the blurry ones were always too blurry and the beautiful ones are too beautiful. Yep, they're all hoaxes. That's yep, right. and now with the, with the age of computers now, if if anyone just just decides to say well it's CG well that's that yeah so to me it to me it's always the same the the people who believe don't need any further evidence and the people who don't nothing is going to make them believe it until totally one of these things you know shows up on their patio uh, they're just going to be like you know we're imbeciles and they're on the right side of the fence. No, I, I totally agree. And I've I've just said that recently when I was talking to Seth, uh, I said, you know, uh, a photo and a video, not going to do it. Never. It'll never happen. That it will never actually prove it to science or the scoptics or the skeptics. It'll take a lot more than that. A body, a piece of a body, some DNA, and then we will have proof. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's the way it's going to go. And from what I hear from some of these people, there have been bodies, and uh, yeah, we don't know about it. So you know, right. whatever, you know, on and on we go with you know, keeping the locals quiet. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's <laughs> right. You know, keep them happy. Keep think. them fishing. You know. Keep you know what? Uh, my wife comes from South America, and uh, occasionally we have the uh, Spanish news network on the television. And it's funny, when you watch their news broadcast, they occasionally throw some curveballs in there as far as uh, UFOs or chupacabras. Or, and they're talking seriously about it. You right. know, they're not, they're not laughing or, 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 or chuckling about it. when It's part of their broadcast, and they show it just like they would talk about a, a heroin bust. Yes. You know, this is the next segment of their news, and they're talking about uh, some type of uh, oddity, but we don't get any of that around here. Mm-mm. You know, it's it's just kind of like you know, everybody's kind of goofy and uh, kid childlike about these things. When you know, ooh, you know, you saw what? <laughs> yeah, it's all for a giggle <laughs> until yeah. they need an adult diaper on a hiking trip like one of these <laughs> folks. Then they won't be laughing. Yeah, I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, well, you want to yeah. dig in? You want to dig into the Great Divide let's Trail do Encounter? It. Yeah, let's head up to uh, Country for a little bit. Yeah, this is uh, this is pretty incredible. Uh, Dave Sorensen and Mike Ruddick were heading off to Jasper National Park in the summer of 1987. Uh, both of these guys were both uh, Ironman competitors and had traveled to the park from the Pittsburgh area. Since they were competitive swimmers, runners, and bikers, their friendship evolved into taking hiking trips together annually. And this was one of those trips. Dave and Mike were both present uh, for my interview, and so from here on out, it will be the two of them telling their story. Mike liked to pick unusual rural places for our annual hikes. We're not necessarily looking for the greatest physical challenge, but we don't shy away from that either. For this trip, we picked the largest national park in the Canadian Rockies, and no matter how you slice it, this place is wild country. Within its borders, the park has some of the most beautiful rivers and snow-capped mountains that you will ever set your eyes upon, as well as the most gorgeous lakes that you will ever see. Surrounded by alpine meadow areas, which I thought only existed in Switzerland, Additionally, the park is home to an abundance of wildlife, including bears, moose, and elk. One of the things that attracted us 
attracted us to this area was that you can actually stay in the town of Jasper. From Jasper, you could drive into many access areas of the park, with there being over 600 miles of trails within the park's boundaries. And I was told that most of them had started off as game trails. For our trip, we flew into Calgary International Airport, rented a car, with the transition being sweet and easy. There were a number of lodging accommodations located within the vicinity of the park, as well as horse outfitters, guide services, uh, horse uh, outfitters and guide services for those who are interested in such things. It's quite a nice and well thought out operation, but that, that, does, that does not diminish the wilderness of the country. Once you get deep into the park, the human footprint is scarcely present. Our first day in town, we wasted no time. We had seen a tram going up a mountainside and decided to check it out. This Jasper Tramway, it's called, takes you up the side of Whistler Mountain up to an elevation of about 7,500 feet. It's about a 10-minute ride, which is incredible to say the least, and at the top, there are boardwalks and trails to walk on and have a look around. A tour guide told us that we were seeing six other mountain ranges as well as the Athabasca River and some glacial lakes. It was an out-of-the-world experience, and I highly recommend it. Our first day's hike, we selected, for our first day's hike, we selected the Great Divide Trail. It was categorized as hard, which is fine for us. That day, there were some low-level wispy clouds which were floating over the valley with snow-covered mountain peaks visible in every direction that you turned. It would be very difficult to get lost in here because the mountains are always in view and alongside of you serving a landmark. The lake itself is about 14 or 15 miles long, and there are trails that follow its entire length on both sides. We decided to begin on a trail that hugged the side of the lake before meandering out into a heavily forested area. We were going to head southeast from our starting point and then stop to eat before turning around and making our way back out. As I said earlier, this is wild country, so the trail was little more than an animal footpath, and at times the terrain can be very rough and rocky, making the hike extremely arduous. We like to familiarize ourselves with the terrain before we hike, which is exactly why many novice hikers get in trouble. They, by not surveying the trail first, end up biting off more than they can chew when it comes to selecting a day's hike. Our first day's hike lasted about six or seven hours, and believe me, it was a workout to complete. After spending a relaxing night in town conversing with some of the locals and chowing down, we made our plans for the next day. We decided to begin in the same area, but this time we would take a slightly more westerly approach. It looked like deeply timbered and rocky terrain lay in that direction, which would push our limits physically. We set out early in the day, making sure to carry two compasses like we always do. It gave us a backup in case something happened. We always try to keep track of landmarks in the surroundings as we hike. This can be extremely difficult in heavily forested areas, which is how people get lost in the woods. So it's kind of interesting, these points in that out. Yes. On this particular day, we were passing through large stands of spruce and fir trees. So it was relatively easy to keep our bearings as we moved along. We were about two hours into the hike, when we entered yet another stand of trees. This stand was fairly dense since all the trees grew relatively close together. You couldn't see clearly for any great distance, but at times there were clear lanes for a couple of hundred feet. As we were approaching one such area, I waved to my partner asking him to stop and be quiet. I had seen something large and reddish brown moving amidst the trees. And my first thought was that it had to be a grizzly bear. As we stood there, I pulled my field glasses up to my eyes, moving slowly so as not to provoke whatever it was. And it wasn't a grizzly bear at all. 
the beast that I was seeing stood straddling a large felled tree. Bears don't do that. Just as I was coming to grips with the reality of what I was seeing, Mike shouted, go bear, go bear. So he's yelling at this bear before he realizes his partner had seen what it was. Oopsie. Big oopsie. What a mistake that was. Of course, he couldn't see what I was looking at through the binoculars. And in one fluid movement, the beast that was straddling the log jumped up, turned towards us. It took about two quick steps, flexing its body. It lifted its head into the air like a wolf and unleashed an earth-shattering scream. For a moment, it paused and stood looking directly at us, grunting. After several long seconds, it reached down, grabbed a piece of tree limb, and hurled it towards us, which was followed by yet another blood-hurtling howl. The sound was so powerful that it sent reverberations through my whole body. I thought to myself that surely the entire park must have heard it. At, do- at that moment, I realized the futility of carrying bear spray. <laughs> There was no way that I would want this thing to get close enough to me for the spray to be effective. If I had a gun, I would have already been shooting at it. This was neither a man nor a bear. It was a monster. I could see Mike's hand shaking. I wasn't the only one terrified of the beast before us. This monster was well over 10 feet tall, and might e- and I might even go so far as to say that it was almost 14 feet tall. We have been close to bull elk, and in Yellowstone, we were not far from a large grazing buffalo. But this thing must have easily been larger than those. It started rolling its head around like a weightlifter trying to get loosed while swiping its arms back and forth in the air. And every few seconds, it would let out a grunt or a growl. Then, as if things couldn't get any worse, the beast took about three or four more towards us before stopping to snarl at us, which to me was an intimidation move. He wanted to show us that he was the boss. Now, my own chest is a size 52. This is a big bugger, this guy. Yes, huge. I wear a 3X in everything I buy. This monster's chest must have been a 200X. It looked like a living bulldozer with gigantic hands, arms, and legs, and the speed with which it was able to move during the short burst told me that it was going to, if it was going to really charge us, it would have already been on top of us. Suddenly, in the distance, we heard another howling noise which seemed to get this creature's attention. It was prolonged and loud. After the distant howl had faded, the beast turned his attention back to us. It grimaced, showed teeth, before slowly turning away and walking. As it did so, it craned its neck backward, looking at us several times before it disappeared into the trees. The two of us dropped our packs and sat down. I felt like every ounce of energy had left my body and we were in shock. We must have been holding our breath during the encounter because we were both breathing heavily and panting, fighting to catch our breath. A little while later, we walked over to where it had been sitting. The area reeked of crap and we could see that the beast had been digging in the rotten log. Fat white larvae occupied the decaying bark, and there were a couple of large leaves from some type of plant laying next to the log with a bunch of these larvae lying on top of them. It looked like a dinner plate. This thing must have been gathering food when we had interrupted. So wonder it was pissed off. There were a few large prints around the area, and the impressions were very deep. I put my forefinger into one, and it was so deep that it reached my middle knuckle. And these prints were more than double the length and width of my hiking boots. Mm. Uh, Mike and I had been on many hikes together around North America. We had seen and experienced in great detail a lot of wildlife together. 
and we had both heard many of the stories of Bigfoot and had talked often about them. Both of us had possessed the mindset that we would believe it when we see it. Well, now we were believers because we had just seen it. We never again went to the woods without a gun. Those, Pretty, those poor guys. I mean, honest to God, those poor freaking guys. And these are Iron Men and big dudes. And they're like, oh, we wouldn't have a shot. Mm -mm. No. No, I mean, you have to have the brains to uh, know when to run. You know, yeah. now in some cases, in some cases, you're not given the opportunity to run. But you certainly don't want to walk into uh, trouble. I don't anyway. And, uh, you know, I, I've always said in a fight, everybody gets hurt. Right. Whether you, whether you win or lose, everybody gets hurt. Uh, so, you know, to me, the, the best thing to do is walk away and if pursued or if it insists, then you have to you take care of business, you know? Uh, but these guys, you know, this thing did a couple of bluff charges on them and, uh, at the speed it had come at them, where are you going to run anyway? Yeah. yeah. So they just kind of stood still and waited to see what would wash out. Uh, but thankfully for them, it seems like it was called uh, by another creature with this second howl being heard in the distance. And they said it got its attention and it turned and walked away. So there's no doubt they're communicating. Uh, probably in a variety of ways. Uh, I had the story uh, called, and we'll probably dig into that somewhere down the road, not today. Uh, I entitled it, It's Not Wood. And basically a landscape photographer and his wife went into an area. Uh, I'm giving you the super, super duper condensed version. Yeah. Sighted out a Bigfoot in the distance in their binoculars and in the camera lens watched this creature raise its hand to its mouth and lift its head up. Right as it did that, they heard a large, a loud knocking sound resonating through this canyon, and then it lowered its hands. Moved around a little bit, did a couple of things, this and that, then it stopped and did it again, made the, you know, the whatever the sound was, super loud, hands up to the sides of the mouth, and started walking around again. Mm. So I said after I heard that, that maybe it's not wood. Yeah. Maybe it's not a wood knock at all. Right. Or maybe it's an, an, uh, something done uh, internally, uh, and maybe there's also wood knocking going on. Yeah, it very well could be. And in fact, you know, something with the Great Divide Encounter and with Dave and Mike... As you mentioned, it seems like the other one called the one that was so close to them away. And, you know, it's conjecture and it's just your opinion. But I, I wanted to ask you, do you think that most of the time they do end up walking away from people that happen to stumble upon them or see them and get in close proximity? They will walk away from us because they know if they kill one or both, you know, if you kill a person, more will come looking. Well, I, you know... I don't know if they have the ability uh, to make some type of rational decision uh, because as we'll read in the logger's tale, uh, this particular critter was more than comfortable with screaming chainsaws. Mm -hmm, so I'm not, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not so convinced that these things are afraid of shooting uh, afraid of explosions? I, I don't know. You know, we can't ask them any questions. <laughs> you know, why run away? Why did you run away? You know, but... Uh, and, and before you go on, Bill, just really quickly, one of the reasons that I chose The Great Divide and The Logger's Tale uh, to kind of coexist with each other is because they both mention the sighting of the creature's quote-unquote fangs. And I just wanted to... Uh, bring this up really quickly. Something that Dave and Mike said uh, is that when it grimaced at us, I could see fangs, not like a tiger's, but longer than the rest of its mouth. 
Uh, right, and right. he said, thank goodness I wasn't, we weren't its next feast. And here's something so interesting and terrifying. It said its jaw protruded from its face and the mouth area was massive when it howled and you could have put a cantaloupe in there with no problem whatsoever. I mean, holy smokes. No thanks. Yeah, and it's funny because you're actually reading the end of the story. Uh, fine, you know, you're, you're bringing out some of the, uh, the evidence as seen by the uh, people. And, you know, a lot of people say, uh, they argue the point like they're experts. Like, who's Bert? Thank you. I, 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 want, to, I want to meet a Bigfoot expert. Thank you. Uh, I like you, ex- Bill. I really like you. <laughs> you like well, to laugh, are- and now you're saying the same things I do. I'm like, who the hell is an expert? How is that even possible? Yeah, how do you become an expert at Bigfoot? You know, like your word, the end all, be all. That's right. Uh, but yes, uh, a number of people, which, and of course, you know, we have slightly overhanging uh, bicuspids just as human beings, mm-hmm. which enables us to eat some meat as well as, you know, having molars and whatnot to grind grains and, and eat vegetables. But these creatures have been said by many, oh, they don't have any fang teeth. Well, that's not what I'm hearing. I've had some people describe their teeth as being large chiclets, huge white squares. One guy said they look like his mule's teeth. And then you have a couple other people that are saying they saw fangs. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, I, and you know, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't know if you were going to get to the rest of that tale or not. No, or if you no, wanted to go on. I apologize. No, it's fine. Uh, and, and I'm glad to see that you read it. Uh, I love the tales. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to read them like if you're up at a cabin somewhere by yourself on the front porch. I wouldn't recommend it, but yes, the, the book is fantastic. Yeah, no, they... Uh, and, you know, again, it's not that everything is uh, over-the-top frightening, but I say, like, it's frightening enough just to be near one of these things. Yes. Just to have said, I saw it stand, turn, and walk away. To me, that's frightening enough because, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't mix with some people to admit that, wow, that would scare the daylights out of me. <laughs> right. You know, instead of playing the macho man, you know, like, uh, oh, uh, well, if I see a Bigfoot, that'll be the last day on earth for that critter. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's yeah, that's not going to happen, my friend. You better go sh- seek out psychiatric help. Uh, oh, no, and here's <laughs> the thing, and you brought it up with them communicating. Here's the problem with those kind of folks, right? You might take that critter out. What about the two or three around you that you don't see? How are you going to deal with yeah. that, right? Yeah, how about family members? Yeah. But uh, they seem to be extremely stealthy, Uh even in spite of their size and their mass, uh, they know what they're doing, you know, and in their own way, uh, they've been by design created to do what they have to do to survive as well. So, you know, it's not like they're Frankenstein walking through the woods with flat-footed wooden boots going, Ugh. That's pretty much how yeah. we go through the woods, though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. to them, they're like, oh, I heard right. you like five miles ago, guys. <laughs> right. Here's another one of them dumb humans. Yeah, exactly. Com- We're like, coming oh, through. On. They're like, yeah. oh, they're, how cute. They're, they're actually in camo. Like, we can't see them or hear them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, it is. It really is incredible the way we look at ourselves uh, and uh, the way the animals behave just naturally. Yeah. Uh, y- your best hunters are uh, clueless in stalking and whatnot uh, relative to these types of creatures. You know, we right. just don't possess the physical attributes or the stealth uh to do it you know uh but you know we do our best and we have success but these creatures are just like over the top uh with their abilities uh to move and uh to muscle things around and stuff you know i like to they, refer to them as the liam neesons of the woods i i like liam neeson so i usually tie that in although i read an article that he's anti-gun which i'm like please god don't tell me that liam neeson is anti-gun but anyhow Another subject. Yeah, well, he ain't that gun, but he doesn't have a problem picking up a number of guns in his movies. Oh, yeah, he'll he'll fire with both hands and both feet at the same time. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's funny how uh, 
Hollywood people seem to go that way. <laughs> yeah. You know. I, I just refer to them that way uh, as far as if you just take the characters he plays in the movies, obviously not him in real life because he's he's anti-gun, but whatever, that's fine. It's, uh, we'll just go yeah, off well, the movie uh, guy. I'm not a big movie goer, but I know the name... And I recall trails on this guy where it seemed like he was playing, uh, you know, always some nasty role, you know, uh, trying to do in some bad guys or taking revenge or something. Oh, you know, yeah, and he's and great at it. I mean, he, he knows all the weapons and he's got all the skills. And if he has no weapons, he still kicks butt because he kind of knows a little karate <laughs> or jujitsu or something, you know. So that's why I'm like the Bigfoot are like the Liam Neesons of the woods. They just handle yeah. business and yeah. nobody even sees them coming. Yeah. Who knows yeah, luck, how good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's nuts. Liam's Absolutely on your case. nuts. Uh, yeah, so that's a great divide uh, trail in Karen. I mean, you know, once again, you're left with the prospect. Is is everything jive? Is everything a story? I don't know. People are going to believe what they want to believe, you know? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I just I was just finishing up a story tonight uh, right before I knew you would be calling. And uh, just the long and short of it was, these couples saw a Bigfoot. They were watching swans swimming down the shore of a lake uh, in an area where there was uh, high willow grass along the shore of the lake. They saw something raise what they believed to be its back above the height of the grass just briefly and then go back down. The hunt pointed it out to the wife, and then she was watching. Now, the... The grass and the lake and the swans that were swimming, as well as where they saw this back, were all like in one field of view as they looked straight forward. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, you know, the eyes had to dart to the left to look over here and back to the swans. They were like right near each other. This thing blasted its arm out of the grass and snatched a swan out of the lake. Oh, my God. Right out of the weeds. She said it looked like, the woman said it looked like a prize fighter's jab. And on the retrieving end of it, as fast as it had happened, the swan was gone. They saw some rustling around going on in the grass after the snatch. And then the Bigfoot stood up, turned, looked directly at them, which made her think this thing didn't know we were there. Because they were in bright colors, and they weren't looking to hide themselves from anybody. They were out walking around taking pictures. Right. It looked at them like just to acknowledge, oh, two people. Had the swan in its hand and walked away. Now, they waited there for about a half an hour, not willing to just move for obvious reasons. Smart move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then they walked back over where this thing had been. And they saw the grass was entirely matted down. Now, I think they said the grass was like feet tall. Wheat. They described it as being wheat-like in color. They saw the grass was entirely matted down, and she said it looked like an alligator had just crawled through there. Oh, man. So this thing had crawled up through the grass. Obviously, to them, had done this before. Like it was practice at how to snatch a bird along the lake or how mm. to have a good shot at it. Crawled up, must have saw the swans coming and said, well, maybe if I hide over here, they'll come close enough this time. And when they came by, whammo, right out of the bushes, around the neck, uh, swan dinner. That I would mean, be incredible I, to see that. And what a tactical move by that creature to do that. And he crawled in and sat and waited, and he was quiet enough that they came right up there. Well, you know, if you watch, like, I don't go for this because I feed the birds around me all the time. And if I see a, a, a cat in my neighborhood going after the birds at my feeder, you know, they better hope I don't have something in my hand because I'm throwing it. <laughs> right. But I'm not I really watch, a cat person either, so... I, yeah. Well, I don't mind cats, but there's too many of them around, and the people are not being responsible with them. Yeah. They're letting them loose around neighborhoods, and they're coming into people's yards like me where I have feeders out in birdhouses, and they're stalking birds on the ground that are eating sunflower seeds that fell from the feeder or whatever. 
and I've seen a couple of these things slowly approaching uh, birds. And, you know, of course, I'll jump out and say, hey, you know, get out of here. But before you've had a chance to do that and you're actually watching them, I wonder how many times they hit during a month right. with no success. Right. You know, they, they probably will try a stalk because, like, they have to. It's in them. I've got to, you know, stalk, please. I'm a predator. And I think that these Bigfoot probably do the same thing with without success on many occasions. So, I mean, it's just a thought. I have no evidence. I'm st you know, it's just the way my mind works when I'm thinking about these things, you know? Well, I love that woman's description. She said it was like a boxer's jab. It was that quick. Yeah, well, she saw this thing, which she then knew was an arm after they saw it, just go like, boom, just in and out. And the swan was retracted as it came back. Mm. And she said that the other swans were in the water, like, you know, what just happened? <laughs> they had no <laughs> they were, clue. They're like, where'd Billy? Yeah, you know, Lou, <laughs> Louie just disappeared. Yeah. Where'd Bobby go? <laughs> now, oh my, and, and now we need the uh, that little groundhog. He's like, Alan, 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 Steve, wait, no, it's Steve, Steve, Steve. I love that video. I'm sure they were like, what the, what the hell just happened? Yeah. 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 They and, didn't uh, even fly off, so it was that quick. They didn't yeah, see they, it. Yeah, it, it's almost like, you know, uh, well, it's similar in that, you know, have you ever watched, uh, and I've only seen videos of a lion attack in Africa. Mm -hmm. the, the lions will run out, uh, maybe two or three of them, giving pursuit to an antelope or something. And once they've taken it down, the other antelopes and the creatures around kind of stop running and then huddle up and will start eating again. It's it's almost like they they know that okay well it's over for now right right and uh, you know they know the deal they know the lions are going to start tearing this thing up and fighting with each other and they're like okay well I'm okay yeah that's let's, true uh, they're good for now it, it's like when you see the cop and he's got a person pulled over it makes you feel a little better like well he's busy for now of course there might be another one up the road somewhere but it makes you feel better. At least at that point, <laughs> the cop's busy. Highway Patrol has that guy pegged. You're safe for now. Yeah, yeah, he's busy. And I'm glad <laughs> you mentioned Highway Highway Patrol because we're going to get into that one. And that is just yes. a mind -blowing. Oh, that poor freaking guy. Yes, but before that, <laughs> um, yeah. we're going to go to Northern California and the Logger's Tale. This is the one I was laughing about it as far as the name uh, goes yeah. in the beginning. So, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's frightening. Uh, well, uh, as I started out the story I wrote, this story is very brief but quite telling. Uh, it was brought to my ears by Jimmy Schmidt, who was a logger in Northern California many years ago. Uh, and without any further ado, once again, here is Jimmy's story. In the late 80s, I was a faller for a logging firm in Northern California. We were the guys who went into a sale ahead of the heavy equipment. Our job was to take down all of the trees and ready to sail for haulage. Usually, we went in as a group of four to six men, depending on how big the workload was. We also frequently found ourselves in some very desolate areas simply because of the nature of our trade. Some of these places were real no-man's land. On this particular job, four of us took the crummy into the far end of the sail. The crummy being a real crap box of a truck. <laughs> <laughs> I would have chosen the other word, Shannon, yeah, but no, I passed okay. on it. Uh, other wordage is used there, folks. Uh, okay. Uh, this was some really thick and tall wood, the kind of place where men like us could get hurt if we weren't being careful. We were what are called jippos, which are contract loggers. For this job, we had been contracted by a paper company to clear this particular sale and haul it to the mill. Late in the afternoon, I started to get wind of what I can only describe as a real stench. 
not knowing what it was or where it was emanating from, I kept working. A short time later, the punk on our crew came over by me and asked me what the stink was. And I told him I didn't know. By the end of the day, we had made it through about half of the sail and split. The next morning, we piled into the crummy with our gear and headed back into the sail for the second day's work. The stench from the day before was still wafting around in the air, which I thought was very unusual because I had never smelled anything like it before. A couple of hours into the day, the punk had stepped away to take care of business when he started shouting, Hey, you guys, come over here. Check this crap out. Well, we all went over to see what the commotion was about, and there it was, a big pile of crap. It must have been 10 pounds, and it was fresh. It looked human, but the pieces were really long and wide. Some appeared to be 14 to 18 inches long and maybe 3 inches thick. There are no humans who back one out that large, I can assure you. And this was no animal turd either. We stood there staring stupefied at a pile of crap and wondering just what was in here with us. Later that afternoon, as we were tearing through the timber with our sores screaming, I felt like I was being watched. That's all I can say. A few minutes later, I caught sight of something out of the corner of my eye, and turning my head to look, I saw a monster of mammoth proportions peering out from behind a large pine. Immediately, I knew it was a Sasquatch. It was about 12 feet tall and as wide as an outhouse. It stood there, swaying back and forth, apparently unafraid of his noise. I ran to the other men and pointed in its direction. It had already started to move, but it was still unobstructed, and we were all looking directly at it walked away. It looked over its shoulder at us. Its butt must have been four feet wide, and its legs and back were just as massive. The lat muscles on its back looked like two by 12 boards springing out of its body, and it was singing slowly as it bobbed away from us and passed out of sight. We all jumped into the crummy and took off. I quit the crew that day and never went back into the woods. And I never saw the guys who were with me that day ever again, and I even left some uncollected pay on the table. So then the guy went on uh, to give me some details. And he said, it didn't come out from behind the tree because it was three times as wide as the tree. It was just shielding itself from full view. He said maybe it had been moving and had stopped there to hide once it saw me turn. At any rate, when its face appeared, it was looking straight at me. We were eye to eye. That face did not look human. Yeah, it had a nose and a mouth and eyes, but this thing was an animal, not a man. The eyes were very dark, dark if not black. The face, chest, and inner thighs had some exposed skin, but the rest of it was entirely covered in hair at, that was so dark it was almost black. For some reason, I clearly remember its fingers. They looked like they were 10 inches long, and I could see its teeth. It looked really angry, but made no sounds at all. Its two fangs were slightly longer than the rest of its teeth. When I ran to get the guys and pointed at the beast, its back had been facing us, and it had already covered quite a bit of ground as it left the area. The back was completely covered in black hair, and its head swept with the shoulders. Compared to the dimensions of the body, the head looked somewhat small in size and was actually sunken down in front of the upper back muscles. So I could not even see the head from the back. Everything about it was pure muscle and totally beyond the realm of human normalcy. The thighs alone must have been several feet in circumference 
and its back was V-shaped in a way that looked like it could bench press a... The creature's arms must have hung seven feet from the shoulder. It was so gigantic that it seemed there would have been no defense against it should it have decided to attack. I'm not even sure a couple of well-placed rounds would have been enough to take it down. Mic drop on that one. There you go, folks. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, considering what he saw and the dimensions that he, he said it was, he, even he said a couple of well-placed rounds, nah, you may still not uh, bring the thing down, and you're still in trouble. Yeah, yeah and it's just, uh, you know, you're talking about something that is so massive, so shocking, so out of the norm of what anybody on this planet is used to seeing, or even if you're not used to seeing it, what you can handle. Right. That it's just, it, it's just fear, uh, dread. Oh my God. You know, get out now. You know, this is not, this is not a happy time. Now look, these guys had chainsaws. I'm sure this guy would have been holding the chainsaw or revving out if this thing made a move towards him. Right. But the fact that it was moving through the area while they were screaming with the saws was a little bit, you know, I don't quite know what the word for that is, but right. uh, that's a little bit freaky. Of course, at that point, the Bigfoot's like, well, no need for my Liam Neeson skills. I can just go traipsing around like these fools can, and, and they won't hear me, at least until the saws go off. But, yeah, that was... Um it was interesting that would be in the area anyway, because some people think that the more noise you make, then, oh, well, no, they're not going to come in. You're not ever going to see a Bigfoot like that. Well, that's not always the case. Yeah, and maybe they're attracted to noise. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, what are the, what are the dummies doing now? What, what, are the, <laughs> what are the hairless yeah. pink things doing now? What's going on over here? <laughs> yeah, so again, with the fangs in this story and mm -hmm. the swaying and the swaying comes up in a number of the encounters that you have collected and I wanted to ask you if you think that the swaying of these which we've heard time and again in a lot of these encounters has anything to do with maybe some kind of a, a depth perception for them it increases it or it, it helps them somehow with their vision or is that uh, I mean what does make of the, the swaying motion that uh, sometimes is reported if you're asking me personally, my opinion is that it's 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 something they do they're doing prior to potentially doing something else. Mm, okay. And uh, I say that when I think of a fighter in the ring, uh, that's mm. coming to my mind because of the jab up. of what I was just telling you about. Yeah. You know how when they're warming up and they're just kind of, I, I even see soccer players. We watch mm. a lot of soccer's. Uh, I see them kind of warming up. They're going left and right at the waist. They're kicking their legs around. They'll do a few fast steps. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is very common in athletics uh, across the board. Uh, in any sport, people kind of move around to get limber. And it seems like these guys are getting limber, too, to me. You know, I don't know. It could be a nervous twitch. You know, they're, they're uncomfortable that now they've been seen. Right. Although, to me, most of the time they wouldn't be seen unless they wanted to be seen. Uh, yes, I absolutely believe that. Most of the time I do feel like they you hit the lottery, well, depending on who you ask, <laughs> of course, uh, yeah, yep. what, what the experience was. or Yeah, they, they're like, okay, congratulations, you've seen me, and you can identify me as not a bear or a person in a ghillie suit. I am a Sasquatch. You're welcome. Yeah, and a lot of these are accidental. You know, to people, a lot of these sightings are accidental. Yeah. Uh, particularly in ones where somebody uh, sees one darting across the street. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it was chasing something and just happened to jump in front of your car at 60 miles an hour with the headlights on and you got lucky. Uh, but other than that, I'd say it seems like 9 out of 10 people who have an encounter are pretty much out there doing something that's not really normal. I'm not saying they're doing weird things, but, uh, you know, they're, they're in areas that are not mobbed with people. Right. And, uh, you know, they're kind of outdoorsy and, 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 and on the fringe, so to speak, of 
what most people do with their time, you know. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you've ever heard this encounter. Uh, we first took it on when I was still with uh, Wes on Sasquatch Chronicles, but Chris recently came back on with me because I figured that plenty of people maybe hadn't heard that. Uh, it was one of the most horrifying encounters I've heard. And he was he was in like a, a Boy Scout camp, basically. Uh, and he and another boy went off to, you know, uh, smoke a cigarette, do something naughty, get away from the adults. And on the line, he and the other boy see a massive Bigfoot. And in one hand is an article of uh, clothing or a blanket. He said it might have been like a plaid uh, or something like that. In its other hand is the top half of a dog, like a medium-sized dog. Just just the top half, though. Um, mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. of course, to him, he looks back and... Friend's already gone. Uh, he can see his rear end, like, going through the brush where they came in from, and he's just standing here going, oh, my God. In actual hell am I supposed to do now? Um, but seeing something like that changes a lot of these folks' lives. And, in fact, he is just now going back into the woods uh, with I helped hook him up with. And I think even now they're still just going out during the day, and they don't go very far in. And um, that was... Um, 15 plus years ago, maybe more. I'm trying to think of how old he is now. I remember, but um, yep. it's life-changing. It would be horrifying. Well, they do. Uh, they do. Uh, they're very opportunistic. Uh, there's no doubt that they'll take your dog if you leave it out and they're yeah. around. Take your cat. Uh, take your bunny. Take your hog. Take your chicken. You know, uh, eat your fruit or fruit trees. Grab grab corn off your corn uh, stalks. Uh they're, they're opportunistic, they're survivors, they know what's around. If they're hungry, they're going to jump on whatever they can. Uh, and to me, they don't care if it's your pet uh, or anything else for that matter, you know. Yeah, and you know, Bill, something that bothers Chris to this day, and he says, I, I hope that, best case scenario, that was the dog's blanket. But he goes, how do I really know that? I hope that's what it was, right? Like. Yeah. I, I don't know. Could have been a piece of clothing. So he's always left to wonder all these years, like, what did what was he carrying besides that dog? What what did that article of uh, cloth belong to? Yeah, well, it's all very creepy and uh, we don't have the answers. I don't think we'll ever get get the answers. Bill, but, uh, you know that we just need to talk to one of the experts. Yeah, right. Just as the experts, <laughs> they have they have all the I answers, know. you know. They know they and they know exactly how many the feetses are running around in the country somehow. They know the number. <laughs> they know they have population numbers, Bill. Right. There's not many here. There's an abundance yeah. here. There's that, 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 that. Yeah. I, 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 they're like statisticians, you know. Mm-hmm. If you want to know anything, give me a call. Drop a dime on me, and I'll tell you what's going on. Hey, they're about it, it, as accurate as weathermen. Am I saying? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it is bizarre. No, it is bizarre. Yeah. You know, like what do you know? All right. So I, 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 go no, ahead. no, go ahead. Finish your. I thoughts. was just going to say I forgot more than you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And I'm just forming things on what uh, individuals say. No, absolutely, and that's why I I appreciate you. Just I, I'm like, what's your opinion on on this action? What they do or what they might do here? It's all conjecture. It's all an opinion. But I just wish more people would say that instead of going, oh, no, you're you're a fool for, you know, saying that a Bigfoot might do that. Here's what they really do. And you're like, how in the actual hell do you know? You don't. Yeah. You don't. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Predictable. Uh, they seem to be, uh, to me, a freaking uh, an animal of monstrous proportions. I don't think they're in any way a human being. Uh, and people have said as much. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know uh, how we even go down the trail of thinking they're, you know, an offspring from humanity or anything like that. Uh, my point, my uh, point is, I think they are just an animal. They're part of the creation, and uh, there aren't uh, tons of them out there. How many there are, who knows? But. They're not running around like deer in my area, I'll tell you that, because I'd be safe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I have a lot of deer around here, and there's no getting away from the fact that there's a huge population on Long Island now because people are constantly clocking them with cars, mm-hmm. uh, complaining that they want bow hunting opened up more, and then 
tree hugging people don't want anybody killing Bambi. <laughs> but yet they'll com- they'll complain that Bambi is chewing up exactly. their hundred dollar shrubs. Exactly. And then the HOA comes out and goes, "Where's your shrub? Put another shrub in there." And you're like, "The freaking deer <laughs> ate it." But the, yeah, I totally understand. <laughs> That's a vicious cycle right there. But you know, here's the thing though: when you're out there doing your your fishing and your your practicing your archery, if you see one of those deer and and he looks like he's running for his life and he looks panting and he's sweating and whatever they do when they're, well. He might be about to see a Bigfoot, I'm just saying, because I've heard a lot of (laughs) stories about that. So you might want to avert your eyes, Bill. Yeah, well, you know, uh, there's no doubt that a beer, a a beer, a deer can only run so far. Yeah. uh, Without, uh, they may die from exhaustion or even have a heart attack. Right, yeah. Uh, They could physically run till their heart explodes and not even know enough to I hate when I exercise that much. You know, I really just have to <laughs> rein myself back. <laughs> Don't explode, Janet. <laughs> I do just, not explode. I got nothing to do but run, run, run all day. Yeah, no, not really. <laughs> um, okay, so when I emailed you, my choice is awesome because you email back and you're like, are you sure you want to bite off that many? And now I see why because there's so much to discuss with each one of these that yeah. I think that we will make for time's sake, uh, and this I think is a great one to end on, and that is uh, Highway Patrol. Um, and is, there's no state listed for this one, but this story is, it's a good one, and it's definitely on a no list. I'd be like, no thanks, I don't want to confirm Bigfoot's real by having it happen this way. But before we get to that story, Bill, let's take a quick break with a word from our sponsor. Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos, all commission-free. While other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, Robinhood doesn't charge any commission fees, so you can trade stocks and keep all of your profits. Plus, there is no account minimum deposit needed to get started, so you can start investing at any level. The simple, intuitive design of Robinhood makes investing easy for newcomers and experts alike. View easy-to-understand charts and market data, and place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. You can also view stock collections, such as 100 Most Popular. With Robinhood, you can learn how to invest in the market as you build your portfolio. Discover new stocks, track your favorite companies, and get custom notifications for price movements so you never miss the right moment to invest. Robinhood is giving listeners of Into the Fray a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your portfolio. Sign up at thefray.robinhood.com. You know, again, here we have uh, a law enforcement guy, has an encounter, is now in retirement, decides to put it out there what he saw this night. And, uh, well, let me just... uh, lay it out there for the listeners and then we can talk about it. Uh, This account came to me from a retired law enforcement officer who told me that he had faced such ridicule about this encounter that I agreed to not even mention what state worked in. Here is John Sorensen's story. I was a 24 year veteran of the force when this encounter happened and I was on highway patrol that night. Most of the old timers preferred the night shift because it was typically quieter than the day. And on this particular night, the weather was crisp and clear. Now, there were a couple of stop signs that I would generally set up on early in the shift. Later in the night, I would hit the main highway with the radar gun. I had a spot that I would back into, which was on a grassy edge of the highway. The forest was my back, and a rock wall dominated my left side. By the time a speeder made it around the granite outcropping and saw my squad car, the gun had already bagged their speed. I had already tagged a couple of speeders that night and was preparing for the next. I turned the car off momentarily and stepped into the trees to take care of some business. It was a pitch black and trust me when I tell you, 
there was no one around in this stretch of highway, just woods and rocky walls. I was finishing up and turning towards the car when I could see headlamps shining around the bend coming towards my position. Remember, nobody could see me here until they had virtually passed in front of me. Just as I had seen the glare of the oncoming lights, the car's horn started sounding, and they were leaning on it heavily. They flew by and kept going, and I had taken maybe three steps towards the car when a large dark mass came into view from around the wall on my left. Whatever it was came walking along the shoulder of the highway, and it was huge. I immediately knew that this was what the car had honked at. As I was reaching for my flashlight out of my belt loop, I said, Hey you, stop right where you are, and hit it with the light. When I did so, it had turned toward me and growled, and its eyes were glowing red before the flashlight had even hit them. When the flashlight's beam met its face, it let out the loudest, most intense roar that you could possibly imagine. Its head held high into the air and screaming like King Kong. The mouth was wide open and I could see its teeth. I grabbed my revolver and prepared to fire, but I didn't have time to shoot before it had fled. It took maybe four fast steps or leaps for it to clear all four lanes of the highway and both shoulders, disappearing into the night. I jumped into the car and started it up, flipping on the headlights, and I saw nothing. So I turned on my sp and moved across to the far shoulder. When I did, I caught it briefly looking in my direction, with its red eyes beaming in the darkness. The dim things were like red reflectors on a kid's bike, and it turned and hightailed it out of sight into the woods. In total, there were four units on patrol that night, with the dispatcher and the sergeant being back at the station. When I got on the radio, I started to tell everyone what I had seen, which I didn't think would be taken as a joke. That's exactly what happened. The chatter coming over the speaker was ridiculous, and the dispatcher told me to fill out a report. The Bigfoot had to have been seven to eight feet tall, and when the light hit it, I could see dark skin on its face, along with some hair that served as a beard. Its teeth were white squares like big chiclets. I... This is the story I was thinking of, and I didn't even realize we were coming into it yes. when we were talking about teeth before. And the hair was quite long and massive. Its head and shoulders were like one unit, kind of like a turret on a tank. It was the most frightening thing that you could imagine, and then some. I don't know why I didn't pull the trigger, but when you fire around as a cop, it's a big deal. And firing around at a Bigfoot, well, you could just imagine how well that would go over. As the thing turned to cross the street, I saw that it must have been five feet across at the shoulders. And the fur on its butt was totally encrusted with leaves and old crap. While it was near me, the stench which was emanating from it was sickening. The next day, I came back to the spot with my truck, walked on the shoulder, and then walked back to where it had come from. I could clearly see some heavy impressions in the soft grass of the shoulder. And when I crossed over to the side where it had run from view, I could see even deeper impressions. These prints were large and maybe close to 20 inches long. You can't believe the garbage that I had to put up with after, and I retired shortly thereafter, doing 25 years of service. Poor guy. That so, part yeah. that part really broke my heart, because I felt like that was kind of the catalyst. Like, maybe he had been thinking about it for some time, but he didn't want to stick around, considering the, uh, the ridicule this way after actually bringing it up. 
Yeah, he had become like you know, kind of like a laughing stock, and yeah. apparently After didn't take a shine years. to it, you know. Yeah. You know, that, that is so interesting in that encounter that mirrors Dave and Mike's, uh, in the Great Divide encounter. The, they also mentioned that the fur on the creature's butt was all crusted and matted together. And it's kind of like one of those things where like, well, yeah, you know, even though bears are featured in the Charmin commercial, they don't have Charmin. So I could totally see where that might be an issue for the big pizzas and bless their hearts. Maybe that's a big reason they smell. So I just thought yeah, it was really that, cool. I, they uh, both saw that. Yeah. And that's uh, for certain. I mean, you know, look, uh, we're talking about, you know, relieving yourself in the woods. Uh, if you wear, uh, if you watch a, a, a dog go to the bathroom or a cat, uh, they're relatively devoid around the exit port yeah. of uh, long fur. But even me, growing up, we had some dogs. Once in a while, you had to clean them up a little bit. You know, they don't know what they're doing. You know, they're doing their best. But something like this, you know, in the woods, you know, hair, leaves, sitting down, you know, who the heck knows how often they could even think of getting washed or if right. they do jump at a river or whatever. Right, if they even care to. Yeah, who knows? And, uh, I mean, you could put a stink on easily if you had some human traits, I hate to keep saying that because I really don't think these things are in any way human, but if you look at ourselves, if we neglected uh, upper hygiene for 30 or 60 days, you know, uh, which is probably the way a lot of people lived, you know, 200 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't really wash your clothes. If the weather was bad, you certainly couldn't. If it was cold, you certainly couldn't. Uh, you weren't going to go out and bathe in the winter. So I would imagine the human race uh, has been fairly stinky at times in different locations, you know? You know, one of my favorite shows is Deadwood on HBO. And, you know, back when, like, Waldo was out in Deadwood and, you know, it's the, the high time of the saloons and the brothels and all that, and you're just kind of looking at everybody going, God, you guys must have stunk. I mean, they, they would show them bathing in on the show but it's the old school like fill the tub it takes three years to fill the tub and the water's probably cold by the and then you're just sitting in your own uh what's the word you know your own um, yeah your own marination (laughs) how are you really clean you never get clean yeah so i can only imagine what these poor guys must smell like and don't get on the poor bigfoot in florida goodness me all the humidity and then they're washing off in like fetid water and swamps and Holy smokes! No wonder they're called, you know, the 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 skunk ape down there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, we're not we're spoiled. We're not that far removed from being stinky human I'm beings absolutely. walking around. Boy, I tell you what, and, folks. If the lights go out or the water shuts off, first of all, hopefully you guys have crossbows and guns, like me and Bill, like that kind of stuff. But not everybody does. But yeah, I mean, it wouldn't take long for us to go back to uh, to close to medieval times and a lot of bad stuff happening and a lot of stinky folks walking around. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, we're just so far removed uh, walking around with uh, iPhones and uh, yeah. just sitting at computers and uh, talking on telephones and, you know, uh, my house is pretty nice. And, uh, you know, believe me, I got no complaints over yeah. here. I've got plenty of food. Plenty of places I can go to shop for whatever I need, be it clothing or footwear or edibles. And, uh, you know, we have no idea yeah. of the uh, that people have gone through uh, in years past when they didn't have the help that we have, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, um, I mean, look, it's nearly two hours I've kept you, and I said, oh, we'll do an hour and a half. I apologize. Um, I <laughs> I will be diving too probably starting tomorrow because it, I enjoy the books very much. And you, Bill, are, you are very fun to talk to. So I look forward to, uh, to round two with you. Yeah, that's no problem. Uh, I enjoy it myself uh, with kindred souls. And, uh, you know, I find that a lot uh, when I'm talking to people about Bigfoot. It's like the haves and the have-nots, you know, you... You get along with some people, and others just got an edge about them because yeah. they don't they don't like you, and they don't like the subject matter you're talking about. You know, it must be a boring life. I don't. 
Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I'm the kind of person where I'm always uh, reaching out to somebody. I start conversations about strange topics. Yeah. Uh, because I want to see what people have to say. Uh huh. And uh, I'm shocked how many times people have responded with something that really raised my brow, like, wow, you know, I had no idea. But you see, if I hadn't breached a subject of, say, uh, an angel mm -hmm. or a Bigfoot or a UFO, they never would have said what they said to me. Hey, Bill, so is, um, I didn't want to, you know, um, make it about two different subjects tonight, but you did mention that you have experiences with angels, and is that... Are any of those tales on your other website, the propheticpundit.com? Uh, no, I haven't put any of them up. Just a place where I comment about uh, Christianity, Catholicism, uh, man's inability, inability to, you know, get that crap together in this life, you know. Amen to and, that. Um, I mean, is that, are those stories that, you're willing to to tell or to talk about or I mean not not what, on the, on the angel story yeah and, and not maybe for a Bigfoot uh, uh, episode but maybe for something separate if you are willing to uh, to broach those subjects and talk more about that yeah we could dig into that uh, I have a you know I have a lot to say on that subject uh, in particular uh, because of the strong faith that I have yeah. Uh, and a lot of it was reinforced uh, at times in my life when I was somewhat wayward, when I had these experiences, that I realized there was a creator out there who cared more about me than I cared about myself and wasn't readily uh, going to let me go down the path I was heading. Uh, so if we ever have uh, the time and we do the show uh, about uh, angels, uh, you'll see that uh, a couple of my angelic experiences were not on the pleasant side of mm. things. Wow, uh, you really yeah. have me intrigued now. Yeah, if you would ever want to, and I'm sorry for putting you on the spot, first, you don't have to say yes, but uh, as you know, it's a multi-topic show, so if you ever wanted to just hop on and we can we can uh, talk about angels and experiences, uh, you know, religious experiences if you wanted to, I'd be more than happy to have you on for that too. No, uh, and you know, it's... It's, uh, to me, it's a cool subject because there are things going around us, on around us, on a regular basis that your average person is completely unaware of. And is in the uh, arena of uh, angelic and demonic uh, activities. These things are going on on a regular basis. And I am uh, convinced that much of the Bigfoot activity, and I told you before, I think that the real Bigfoot is a flesh and blood living creature uh, that has been around for a long, long time. But then I also have a free belief that there are these creatures, uh, uh, aliens, UFOs, in most circumstances, are demonic in nature, and they're being mimicked or portrayed in a way that is designed to do mm. so you know I mean we could talk about that and you know frankly I don't care if people believe me or not in this circumstance I know what happened to me and whether or not Shannon Legro or anybody else believes me is of no consequence to me whatsoever. I am totally convinced <coughs> that there is a time coming when you're going to have to answer for all the nasty crap you've done. And uh, the evidence of uh, these heavenly beings or angels... Now, keep in mind, can of worms you opened up <laughs> <laughs> I'm all keep about can of worms. Yep. Yeah. Keep in mind that it's normal for people to be afraid when they're confronted with something so otherworldly that they frankly don't know what to do. We see this with the Bigfoot. We see in biblical narratives when angels appeared, like to Mary. Don't be afraid. 
That's one of the first things they did in the narratives that were given. Don't be afraid, Sharon, Shannon. They know you're scared. So, you know, uh, anyways, why don't we leave that for another day? I, and, I mean, uh, I already have the title, Angels, Angels, Demons, and the Mimicry from, I mean, by Bill Sheehan. It's time to talk about that stuff. I would <laughs> love to have you on to cover any of that. That is incredible. Oh, yeah. We I, could, I've we covered could. that stuff a lot, but not nearly enough. People love those episodes. No, I'm, uh, it doesn't take me long to get wound up because <laughs> uh, I tell you what, I've had a lot of experiences in my life. I don't know why. Uh, it is what it is. I know people look at me and roll their eyes, and I, can, I can't imagine what they say about me when I leave the room. But frankly, don't give a rat's butt. We're, we're both in that boat, Bill. We're yeah. both in that same boat, fishing away, not giving a crap, you know? <laughs> I really don't care. <laughs> and uh, I live my life that way, and um, it is what it is. You know, uh, I, I have a conviction in my life that I, I have to share certain things with people that come my way, and I never believe I meet any by accident. Mm -hmm. There was always a reason for somebody coming into my life. I truly believe that. And uh, I'm really, as the older I get, the more I realize that it's true. And the older I get, I have a long history now going behind of events and moments in my life where there is no doubt that these things happen for a reason. But you don't know you don't know that a child coming out of the womb you don't know what it is to be fifteen to be twenty five you know you have no perception of what's coming down the road yet you haven't been there but when you look back you could say like wow then you admit yes that is the yeah. real conundrum of, yeah. of aging and then realizing. Those were the, some of the best times of my life, but when I was in them, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, or some dangers you encountered where you said, yeah. I'm lucky to be alive. You know, when you look back, and uh, I work in a hospital. I see people dying all the time. I mean, we have people just, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, both old and young. There's constantly codes coming over the microphone of... Uh, Heart attacks and traumas, you know, we have all kinds of codes in the hospital, code blue, rapid response, we have a code for a stroke, and you never know when the jig is up. And a lot of people go to work one day and they don't know they're not coming home tonight. Right. So, you know, there's, there's a part of life that we really need to be a pay attention to. And uh, many people do not. Now we could talk. We talk about angels, demons, and mimicry. Uh, we're going to have a time of it. <laughs> I, I think that was a, a good sell for everybody. A good uh, a good teaser. I know I'm excited because I don't know any. Uh, and the reason I brought it up, everybody, is because he just briefly mentioned it in the intro in Volume One of the book that we covered tonight. And I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. I might have to bring that up to Bill and see if that's on. Because I've noticed you you mend your website and you're a blogger and. So I'm excited. I'm excited to talk about that stuff, too. And, of course, Volume 2, uh, soon to come back to Into the Fray. And before you go, though, mention that one more time where people can buy all of the volumes of Bigfoot Terror in the Woods. Yeah, uh, I set up a page, and uh, the page is www.buybigfootbooks.com. And some recordings on uh, YouTube if you have a shine to you could enter in uh, by uh, by big you could enter in Bigfoot terror in the woods sightings and encounters uh, you'll see there's a string of them there I was experimenting a little bit so be kind to me I only started doing this a, a few weeks back and I, I came out of the gate just talking, and now I've added a little creepy music in there, which I kind of like. It put a smile on my face. And I'm basically reading uh, chapters from the book. And one thing I'm realizing, too, though, from that is that people have a very short attention span because on YouTube it tells you how many how much time yeah. people spent uh, on the page. Yes, yes. 
And I'm doing readings, Shannon. Eight minutes, and, and nine they, minutes. Yeah, they can't make it three minutes, right? Uh, they, they, they can't make it through the... Uh, uh, I know, the, and it's eight minutes. You're like, really, guys? Uh, you know, eight minutes? And, and, you, and you hang out for uh, 4.2? <laughs> You're very, like, that very, was a good part of the story. Where the hell did you go? Very bizarre. And by, might uh, I just say that, you know, you mentioned the whole, like, be kind to me kind of thing on YouTube. YouTube is like, it, what, what's a nice way to say this? It's a cesspool of anonymity where people are just about as rude as they can be just because it makes them happy. It's the strangest thing. YouTube, YouTube is interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, it's just, I'll just, I just want to throw that out there. My episodes are on YouTube as well, just that it's another avenue. Some people, that's the only place they like to listen to podcasts or, or you know, shows or people like you doing readings. But, uh, yeah. Holy smokes, they are interesting folks over there on YouTube. You know, I don't have a lot of uh, experience, Shannon, uh, with the how-to electronically. Yeah. So I'm kind of dipping into things uh, kind of inadvertently and uh, going this way and going that way. Uh, you know, with what I'm able to do and what I'm able to accomplish and trying to move forward, you know. No, you're, you're, you know what, all of us are just doing the best we can, and the nice thing is, though, we are kind of delving into something that, that, and I think that that shows, and it certainly shows with you, and you are a real joy to talk to, uh, and I, I appreciate your time tonight, Bill. Uh, no, thanks a lot for having me on, Jen, and thanks to your audience for listening. Yeah, and I will, uh, I will be bugging you soon, both about angels, demons, and mimicry, and uh, about volume two. Okay, sounds good. I look forward to it. <laughs> Me too, Bill. Thank you so much. All right, thanks a lot. Good All night, right. everyone. Well, I'm so and so. I was given this name by my parents. I've been to such and such a college. I've done these things in my profession. I produce a little bar. Buddha says, forget it. That's not true. That's some of the story. That's all gone. That's all past. I want to see the real you you are now. But nobody knows who that is. Because we don't uh, know ourselves except through listening to our echoes and consulting our memories. But then there's a real evil, and that again leads us back to this question uh, Who are you? That is the real evil. We shall see how they play with this exam by the cohorts to get you to come out of your shell and find out who you really are.
they will say reincarnation means this, that if you sitting here now are really convinced that you're the same person who walked in the door half an hour ago, you're being reincarnated. If you are liberated, you will understand that you're not. The past doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. There is only the present. That's the only real you that there is. The Zen master Dogen put it in this way. He said, the spring does not become the summer. First there is summer, and then there is spring. Straight, 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 straight. 